physician ended the examination and left. Initially, he listed her cause of death as the everlasting faint, and then childbirth. It's unknown if uh, Zona was pregnant or not, but for two weeks prior to her death, Kadab had treated her for female trouble. Remember, he was the doctor as well as the coroner, so Dr. Kanap sent someone out to notify Zona's parents, but uh, word of the young woman's death quickly spread throughout the community. By late afternoon, two young men who were friends of Zona's volunteered to ride out to an area called Meadow Bluff and tell the Heaster family what happened. The Heasters lived in an isolated area about 15 miles away where a small scattering of homes and farms were nestled against the side of Little Suo Mountain. When she was informed of the news of her daughter's death, Mary Easter's face grew dark, and she reportedly said, The devil has killed her. On Saturday, January 24th, Sonia's body was taken by carriage to her parents' home. A handful of neighbors presided over the funeral entourage, and they brought shoe along with them to the mountain farm. He showed extraordinary devotion towards Zona's body, keeping vigil at the head of the open coffin as the wagon traveled over rutted and bumpy roads. Zona's body was displayed in the Easter's home for the wake, an event that lasted all day on Sunday. This gave neighbors and friends an opportunity to pay their last respects to the dead. With a chance to visit one another, to give solace to the bereaved, and bring food for the family. A few local ladies sat up with Sona's body throughout the night until the time of the burial on Monday. Those who came to pay their respects during the wake pointed out the bizarre behavior of Drought instead of Erasmus. They called him Drought. Shoo. His grief swung back and forth between overwhelming sadness and manic energy. He did not allow anyone to get too close to Zona's coffin, especially while he was placing a pillow on one side of her head and a rolled up cloth on the other. He told everyone that these items were to help Zona rest easier. In addition, he tied a large scarf around her neck that it had been her favorite. When it came time to move her to the cemetery, several people noticed there seemed to be a strange looseness to her head. Needless to say, people started to talk, and speculation began about how Zona had really met her untimely demise. Mary Jane Easter, her mother, did not need to speculate about whether or not Trout Shoe had some part death, because she was convinced that he had. She had disliked him from the start and never wanted Zona to marry him. She was sure that he had murdered her, but she had no way to prove it. After Zona's wake, Mary Jane took the sheet from inside the coffin and tried to return it to Mr. Shoe, but he refused it. Holding it back up to put it away, she noticed that it had a peculiar odor, so she washed it. She came to believe that what happened next was some sort of a strange omen. She dropped the sheet into the wash basin, wash basin. <laughs> and when she did, the water inside the basin turned red. Strangely, a few moments later, the sheet turned pink and the color in the water disappeared. Mary Jane sheet and hung it outside for several days, but this stain could not be removed. She interpreted the eerie blood stains as a sign that Zona had been murdered. After this strange incident, she began to pray. Every night for the next four weeks, she prayed fervently that her daughter would return to her and reveal the truth about how she had died. And according to her story, a few weeks later, prayers were answered. Over the course of four dark nights, the spirit of Zona Shu appeared at her mother's bedside. She would come as a bright light at first, and then an apparition that would take form, chilling the air and the entire 
right. She would kill her daughter, and the word of Sona's spirit had proved it. A short time later, Mary Jane went to the local prosecutor, John Alfred Preston, to try and convince him to reopen the investigation into Sona's death. She offered the visitations from her daughter's spirit as evidence that a miscarriage of justice had taken place. By all accounts, Mr. Preston was both polite and sympathetic to Miss Mary Jane. The two spoke together for several hours, and at the end of the meeting, he agreed to dispatch deputies to speak with Dr. Knapp and a few others that were involved. While it seemed unlikely that he was willing to take another look at the case because of the statement of a ghost, the investigation did get reopened. Local newspapers reported that Mrs. Easter was not the only one in the community who was suspicious about Zona's death. There were also certain citizens who had started to ask questions, as well as growing rumors in the community. Mr. Preston himself went to see Dr. Knapp, and the physician admitted that his examination of the dead woman had been cursory and incomplete. The two of them agreed that an autopsy was needed to answer the questions about Zona's death once and for all. If Trout Shoe was innocent of any wrongdoing, this would clear his name. A few days later, an exhumation was ordered, and an inquest jury was assembled. The autopsy was performed in the Nichols Schoolhouse, which was just a short distance away from the Sewell Methodist Church graveyard where Zona was buried. The school children were dismissed on the day of February 22nd, and Zona's, sh Zona's shoe's grave was opened. It was reported in the local newspaper that Trout Shoe vigorously complained about this exhumation, but it was made clear to him that he would be forced to attend the inquest if he did not attend willingly. And he replied, they will not be able to prove that I did it. Which seems like a rather odd and careless statement for a guy who claimed to be innocent and in love with his wife. The autopsy lasted three hours under the uncertain light of kerosene lanterns. The body of the dead woman, Zona, was in a near-perfect state of preservation, thanks to the cold temperatures of February, making the work of the doctors much easier to com complete. A jury of five men had been assembled to watch the proceedings, and they huddled together in the cold building with officers of the court, Trout Shoe, Andy Jones, the boy who'd found the body, and other witnesses and spectators. The autopsy was carried out by standard methods, which meant that an examination of the vital organs came first. After that, the doctors would normally cut an incision along the back of the skull so that the brain could be removed. Now, this step was not taken in the case of Zona Shu because the doctors quickly found what they looked for. One of the doctors turned to Trout and said, We have found that your wife's neck has been broken. Mr. Shoe's head dropped, an expression of despair crossed his face, and he whispered, They cannot prove that I did it. The autopsy findings were quite damning to Mr. Shoe. A report on March 9th stated the discovery was made that the neck had been broken and the windpipe smashed. On the throat were marks of fingers indicating that she had been choked. The neck was dislocated between the first and second vertebrae the ligaments torn and ruptured. The one by Pepin crushed at a point in the front of the neck. Of course, these findings were made public at once, and it upset many people in the community. Trout Shu was arrested and charged with murder. He was locked up in the small stone jail on Washington Street in Lewisburg. And in spite of the fact that the evidence against him was circumstantial at best, he was indicted by a jury was formally arraigned for murder, and he immediately entered a plea of not guilty. While he awaited trial, information about his unsavory past started to surface. Zona had been his third wife. His 
is the unusual circumstances of Zona's death. That was a very weird car noise. I hope you couldn't hear it. Um, he wanted to make sure that she appeared both sane and reliable. For this reason, he skirted around the issue of the ghost because it was bound to make her appear irrational. And also because it was considered inadmissible evidence. The teller of the story, in this case, Zona Shu, could obviously not be cross-examined by the defense, so her testimony would be hearsay under the law. Unfortunately for Mr. Shu, his attorney decided to ask Miss Easter about her ghostly sighting. It seemed obvious that he was doing it to try and make her look ridiculous to the jury, and he characterized her visions as a mother's ravings and worked very hard to admit that she may have been mistaken about what she allegedly saw. He continued to badger her for quite some time, but Mary Jane never wavered in her description of Zona's ghost, nor about what she had told her. When the defense counsel realized the testimony was not going the way that he wanted, he dismissed her, but by this time the damage was done. Because the defense and not the prosecution had introduced the testimony about the spirit to this judge had a hard time telling the jury to exclude it. It was apparent to most of the people in the community. They believed Mary Jane had seen her daughter's ghost, and despite Mr. Shu's eloquent testimony in his own defense, they quickly found him guilty. Ten of them even voted that he be hanged, which spoke volumes about Miss Easter's believability as a witness. Without a unanimous verdict of death, though, he was sentenced to life in prison. This sentence did not satisfy everyone in Greenberg County, and on July 11th of 1897, a citizens group of somewhere between 15 and 30 men assembled eight miles west of Lewisburg to form a lynching party. They purchased a new rope, and they were well armed when they started towards, towards the jail. If not for a man named George M. Hara, who alerted the sheriff, he surely would have been lynched. Hara contacted the deputy sheriff Dwyer at the jail, and it was said that Mr. Shu was informed of this threat against his life, and he became greatly agitated and was unable to tie his own shoes. Sheriff Dwyer hid him in the woods a mile or so from town until deputies were able to disband the mob and return them to their homes. Trout Shu was moved to the West Virginia State Penitentiary in Moundsville, July 14th, where he lived for the next three years. He died March 13th, 1900, from one of the epidemics that swept through the prison that spring. At the time, the prison commonly buried unclaimed remains in the nearby Tom's Run Cemetery, for which no records were kept until the 1930s. And thanks to this, no trace of Trout Shu can be found today. Mary Jane Robinson Easter lived to tell her tale to everyone who would listen. She died in September 1916 without ever recanting her story of her daughter's ghost. As for Zona, her ghost was never seen again, but she left a haunting historical mark on Greenbrier County. It is one that is still being felt today. In fact, a roadside marker along Route 60 still commemorates this case. And it reads, Interred in a nearby cemetery is Zona Easter Shu. Her death in 19, 1897 was presumed natural until her spirit appeared to her mother to describe how she was killed by her husband. Autopsy on the exhumed body verified the apparition's account. Her husband, found guilty of the murder, was sentenced to the state prison. 